Curious Lloyd. The world is full of bizarre, gruesome crimes that are so baffling and creepy that the only one-liner investigators would say is, I've got nothing, please hold me. So let me ease you into another Unsolved Mysteries video, which will truly baffle you. So sit tight. A mobile phone found in a cab contains a video of four unknown men being murdered in the middle of the ocean. In 2014, a student got into a taxi cab in Fiji and found a mobile phone that someone had left behind. Either wanting to locate the owner or hoping to find vulgar photos, most likely a combination of both, he decided to look at the contents of the phone. What he found was a 10 minute video of four men being murdered whilst clinging onto a wreckage in the middle of the ocean surrounded by four ships. Over 40 rounds were fired into the victims, even as they raised their arms in surrender, while an unidentified voice kept shouting, shoot, 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 in Mandarin over loudspeakers. And of course, the student posted that right on YouTube. But the creepy thing about this case is that to this day, no one has any idea who these people are. Authorities have ruled out the possibility of the video being a hoax, or like a viral marketing for a new found footage movie. But no bodies have ever been found, and there's no official reports of an incident like this anywhere. They think the victims were pirates who tried to mess with the wrong fishing boats, but that's only a guess. The murderers haven't been identified either, because it's not like they turned the cameras on themselves and posed for selfies. But wait, that's exactly what they did, for several minutes. The only major clues in the video are a banner with safety as number one written in Mandarin, along with a registration number on the hull of a ship passing by in the background. That ship was eventually identified as a Taiwanese tuna vessel called Chun I-217. The owner of this boat was tracked down, but had little information to offer, since he owned over a dozen fishing vessels and claims it's super hard to keep track of who he lends them out to. But meanwhile, Fijian authorities have pretty much taken a not our problem attitude, since they've had no reports of any missing mariners and believe that the murders didn't occur on their turf, so at least they tried. A man disappears one night and leaves the creepiest voicemail imaginable before being found dead. One September evening in 2015, 32-year-old Minnesotan Henry McCabe went out to a nightclub with two friends but never returned home. One of the friends, William Kennedy, claimed that he dropped McCabe off at a fuel station garage shortly after 2am but had no idea what happened to him after that. Nearly two months later, McCabe's body was found in a lake about six miles away from that fuel garage. There were no noticeable signs of foul play either. According to McCabe's friends, he had gotten quite drunk. So was this merely another tragic case of a drunk man stumbling into the water? That explanation might be easy to believe if McCabe hadn't used his mobile phone to leave the most terrifying voicemail ever. Something truly creepy happens. McCabe's wife was in California that night and at 2.28 a.m. she received a call from him in which she could hear him screaming and saying he'd been shot. When she tried to phone McCabe's brother, the brother's voicemail recorded the last two minutes of the call, which contained bizarre unexplained growling noises, followed by what sounded like high-pitched moans of pain. So have a listen and try to blank out the news reporter at the same time and let me know what you think. It's a voicemail unlike anything you've ever heard before. There are two minutes worth of noises, bizarre ones. But very little actual talking. This noise is followed by a sudden silence, and then the call concludes with a male voice saying, Stop. What the fuck happened to this guy? Well, suspicion fell upon William Kennedy's story because the fuel garage's surveillance cameras didn't show him dropping off McCabe like he claimed. Not only that, but Kennedy also had McCabe's keys on him, even though McCabe would have needed them to enter his house. McCabe's wallet also happened to be in the possession of his other friend, who claimed he took it from McCabe at a nightclub to prevent him from buying any more drinks. Did McCabe's friends murder him because they envied his wallet and keys? Well, probably not, since the police soon found footage of Kennedy dropping McCabe off at a different fuel station, but he simply got the name wrong. Even if you suspect some sort of robbery murder plot here, how would that account for the weird voicemail? Did the perpetrators morph into werewolves before they murdered McCabe? And even though McCabe was heard saying he'd been shot, there were no gunshot wounds or injuries on his body. 
So if that doesn't leave you baffled, I don't know what will. A world-class Sherlock Holmes fan has a bizarre murder mystery death. Richard Lansling Green was considered the world's foremost scholar on Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the creator of Sherlock Holmes and devoted theory believer. On the 24th of May 2004, he was found dead on his bed in his London flat. He had been garroted to death, a shoelace had been wrapped around his neck and tightened with the handle of a wooden spoon. Hmm, it almost sounds like something that John Wayne Gacy would do, but it does get stranger. Prior to his death, Lanceline Green had implied that his life was in serious danger. In order to complete an ambitious biography on Doyle, Green wanted access to a recently unearthed archive of the author's private papers and journals, and he didn't seem deterred by the fact that they were rumoured to be cursed. When Lanceline Green discovered the items were going to be auctioned off to private collectors, he attempted to put a stop to this, and as far as he was concerned, this was enough to bring the wooden spoon carrying assassins out into the open. Lanceline Green became increasingly paranoid and told people he believed he was being followed by an unidentified American. When he invited a friend over for a coffee, he insisted they talked outside because his flat was bugged. If that wasn't enough, when Lanceline Green's sister attempted to call him on the night of his death, she was baffled to hear an American voice on his answering machine. So, was Lanceline Green knocked off by a killer so bold that he literally left his voice behind at the murder scene? Well, it turned out the voice was a generic automated recording which popped up whenever you deleted your own message, which Lanceline Green apparently did for some reason. Since there were no signs of forced entry into his flat, many people started leaning forward to the idea that he took his own life after deliberately planting clues to make it look like a murder, which incidentally mirrors a plot device from Sherlock Holmes' story. So, did Lanceline Green commit the most insane suicide imaginable to make everyone else assume foul play? Maybe, but the problem is that it seemed a little too crazy. The coroner would not rule the death as suicide and had a rather valid argument for doing so. Garroting yourself to death with a shoelace is very, very difficult. There had been only one record case of suicide by garroting in the past 30 years and one expert found it unlikely that Lancelin Green could have asphyxiated himself before passing out first. In the end, the coroner returned an open verdict, so Lancelin Green's death is officially still unsolved. It would take some sort of brilliant one-of-a-kind investigators to solve this one. So, what's your thoughts about this case? A boy just vanishes after his parents crash a lorry of sulfuric acid. On the 25th of June 1986, a lorry was seen speeding at over 75 miles per hour down Spain's Summer Sierra mountain pass, which isn't recommended when you're transporting over 5,000 gallons of sulfuric acid. But sure enough, the lorry ended up crashing and overturning, spilling acid all over the place. After the mess was cleaned up, the two deceased occupants of the lorry were identified as driver Andreas Martinez and his wife Carmen Gomez. The authorities then had to share the tragic news with Andreas' parents, who asked if their grandson was okay. And wait, what grandson? Well, it turned out the couple had a 10-year-old son, Juan Pedro Martinez Gomez, who was seen having breakfast with them that very morning. That at least explained the children's clothes, toys and cassette tapes the authorities had found in the lorry. But there was an even bigger problem now. There was no child. I know what you're thinking. Since there was 5,000 gallons of sulfuric acid involved, maybe the poor kid got dissolved into nothingness. That's what investigators initially thought, but experts determined that this scenario was impossible. At the very least, some bones would have been left behind. So what happened to Juan Pedro? Also, what would compel his father to drive down a steep mountain pass at such a high speed? Now you see, one year after the accident, a package of heroin was discovered inside the hidden compartment of the lorry, leading to speculation that Juan Pedro was kidnapped in order to force his father to participate in drug smuggling. The lorry's tachometer showed that he came to a stop a total of 12 times whilst driving up the mountain, each time for no more than 30 seconds. Was Juan Pedro's father chasing the abductors? Was he desperately looking for his kid? Was he delivering heroin to mounting drug lords? But to further complicate matters, 
Eyewitnesses claimed that they saw a white van driving behind the lorry before the accident. After the crash, a Nordic-looking couple supposedly came out of the van, approached the lorry, and was seen carrying a bundle when they returned to the vehicle. Was Juan Pedro in the bundle? If the couple was involved in the drug smuggling, why would they grab the boy after the crash? And if they weren't drug traffickers, what would their motive be for taking him? And if Juan Pedro was in the lorry when it crashed, could he even survive that to begin with? He would be in his 40s now. If he's still out there, one way or another, he isn't talking. A young man goes missing and his remains are found in the chimney of an abandoned cabin seven years later. In May 2008, 18-year-old Josh Maddox, a chilled guy by all accounts, left his home in Woodland Park, Colorado and was never seen again. His disappearance remained a mystery until seven years later, when a cabin only a quarter mile from Maddox's residence was about to be demolished and a mummified corpse was found inside the chimney in what appeared to be in a fetal position. The body was eventually identified as that of Josh Maddox and I haven't gotten to the weird part yet, until now. Officially, the coroner ruled out Maddox's death accidental and he came up with a rather horrifying scenario. The young man attempted to slide down the chimney but wound up getting stuck and died in there. And in case this story hasn't already ruined Christmas for you forever, the coroner even used the phrase Santa Claus style to describe it. No real explanation was offered for why Maddox would have climbed into the chimney in the first place. But the bigger question was whether it was even physically possible to do so. The cabin's owner insisted that when the chimney was originally built, a heavy steel mesh rebar was installed near the top in order to keep the animals out. Then there's a matter of his clothes, or the lack of thereof. When Maddox's body was found, the only piece of clothing that he had on was a thermal t-shirt. The rest of his clothes were found next to a fireplace inside the cabin. Or maybe, seeing that he couldn't access the chimney from the roof, he stripped half naked and climbed in through the fireplace. But you have two problems with that. Number one, the owner had dragged a large wooden breakfast bar in front of the fireplace, blocking it. And number two, that's pretty nuts. I should mention at this point that Maddox didn't do drugs. So did a particularly strong murderer kill Maddox, move the cumbersome stuff blocking the chimney and stuff his body in there? If so, no one can prove it. While there have been rumors that a currently incarcerated man once bragged about killing Maddox, there was no sign of trauma on his body and no hard evidence of foul play. So officially, his death is still considered to be an accident and destined to remain the only story involving a chimney.